I'm doing well. Um, today I got my acceptance letter to study abroad in Greece next semester. Uh, so I'm excited. Come on now, go, Layla. <laughs> I'm so nervous, but it was one of those things that I was just like, God is calling me to do it, so I'm gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, and he did it, and he met you there, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that, that, I am I, so excited about that. Thank you, God. Mm -hmm. That is incredible. Yeah. Good news, good Woo. news. Well, we are so, so happy about that, that we are going to Greece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when do you leave? I leave September 7th. Oh, this year, September 7th, or next yeah. year, September 7th? Uh, this year. Oh, good. And you'll be there until the following year? Um, I'll only be there until December. So it's like three months. Okay. Oh, okay. Four months, yeah. Not too long. Well, that okay. is exciting. Thank you. <laughs> and I hope that you can still be connected into the Bible mm -hmm. study so we can see Greece, girl. So yeah. Yes, I've seen lots of videos. <laughs> yes, on the journey, because we want to yes. go. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've been to Greece. Um, Greece right? Yeah, I think I've been to Greece one time, but I didn't get to go see everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, we just kind of passed through, so... Wow. I hope through you, I can see a little bit more until mm -hmm. it's So that is really, really awesome and amazing news. So happy. Um, hey, Keisha, how you doing? She thinks hey, how are you? All is well. All is well. Um, we are going to jump right, right in tonight. Um, I was telling Steph, man, the Father has really been challenging me in the Word of God and in just some of our fundamental concepts that we believe, things that we think that maybe that's not what God intended. So we're going to talk about that um, and we're going to be dealing with faith. We're going to be dealing with um. He gave it to me like this. This mountain has to move. This mountain has to move. And I think we're going to do it for the next couple of weeks um, because there are several scriptures that deal with this. And I don't want to bombard us for I know that it's going to challenge our thinking. It is going to challenge our hearts. And it's going to cause us to question things that we once were taught, things that we know. <laughs> so I want us to be able to discuss it walk through it, um, brew over the Thank questions you, that God. we will have because we will have questions <laughs> um, as we're walking this out together. Um, the father is so, so good and so faithful. And I believe that he is calling us higher. He's calling us into a greater level of understanding of his word. Um, so many things that we've been asking him about or asking him to do could it possibly be it hasn't been done because we have the wrong understanding um, and we're expecting something different from what he meant? Um, sure. And so just really digging into that. So let us do our, um, we're going to pray and then let's do our declaration. So let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful tonight for you being with us, touching us, calling us unto yourself, oh God. You are so good and so faithful and so mighty. Lord, I pray for wisdom. I pray for wisdom as we are learning, walking through your word, Father. I pray that you would stretch us, Father God. I pray that you would help us to walk into what you're trying to give us clarity about tonight. And I pray that you would challenge our hearts, Father, draw us closer to you. Um, as your word says that if we draw nigh to you, you'll draw nigh to us. Father, we need you to be near. I pray for each and every one of our understanding, each and one of our knowledge, Father God, that you would just break us open tonight. Um, it's almost like I'm seeing that uh, alabaster being broken um, before the Father, um, before Jesus, uh, when Mary broke that alabaster box. And I'm just, Father, we sit ourselves before you in that way, that you would break us open and that we will be a sweet smelling fragrance unto your nostrils, Father. Mm -hmm. you would help us tonight father fix us where we are are broken hearted fix us where we have unforgiveness fix mm -hmm. us where 
our minds are stuck, Father God, and we haven't been able to move forward. I pray that you would just guide us in every way. Touch every person that will come and those that are supposed to come. Lord, give them the courage and boldness and the um, remind them um, that you desire to meet them in this way tonight. We bless mm -hmm. you, we glorify you in the name of Yeshua, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, let's do our declarations. Glory yeah. to God. Oh, Jesus, we thank you. I'm going to say them as normal. You guys can read along with me. And the reason why we say these is it's very important to put things in, into perspective because as we read the word of God, a lot of times we are, I have no idea what this thing is that has popped up on the screen. Oh, there you go. Um, a lot of times um, as we read the word of God, man, the enemy will come in and he'll try to steal the word out of our hearts. And we want the soil of our hearts to be prepared for what God wants to say. And we don't want to take offense and we don't want to knock it off or or um, just get caught up in things that aren't important. We want to get every single inkling of what the Lord wants to share with us so that we can grow and be strong um, in our faith. So. Repeat after me or read along with me. Lord, I pray today. Um, I pray, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that the word today will find good soil in my heart. <laughs> I reject the thoughts of offense where the light of your word exposes my sin. I do not take offense. I will change. Turn to you, my heavenly father. Hallelujah. I reject condemnation. Your word says that Jesus did not come to condemn people. This word does not come to condemn me, but it comes to heal me. I reject accusation. Satan is the accuser of brothers and sisters, and this word does not come to accuse me or abuse me. This word exposes Satan and his lies, and I choose to believe and receive the truth. God says in his word, blessed are my eyes for they see and my ears for they hear. For many prophets and righteous men desire to see what I see and did not see it and to hear what I hear and did not hear it. Therefore, I will hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against or miss the will of God. So important. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your word today amen amen hallelujah um to give us a little bit more precursor like i said um the father dealing with me on this mountain has to move this mountain has to move when you guys hear that what comes to your mind this mountain has to move what comes to your mind I think of change. Change, okay. Real good, real good. This mountain has to move. What comes to your mind? Uh, I said block, blockage. <laughs> blockage. Something blocking. Yeah. Something blocking, okay. Go ahead, Steph. I see, Um, when I think of mountains, I think of we... RV'd out in um, to see the Grand Tetons, and they're just these beautiful, majestic, massive things, you know. And when I this mountain has to move, I think of something like it's absolutely beautiful and majestic and mighty, and I think of it moving. I think of it's almost like impossible, you know, like it's huge. Um, so it must be like very difficult, hard, like something that only through God we can move this huge thing. Okay, good, good. Anybody else? This mountain has to move. I think of like pushing past opt obstacles. Obstacles, okay. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Awesome. Anyone else? This mountain has to move. Man, it's so good. Um, all of what you said is really, really on point and on target. Um, a lot of times I started thinking and pondering over this. A lot of times when I hear about the mountain being moved, 
it is thinking of or it's speaking of possessions. It's speaking of um, things that stopping you from getting something. It has to be moved out of my way. Um, uh, much of coming up hearing different teachings in the Christian arena in America, more specifically, um, you hear a lot about, because listen, American Christianity is all about getting something. I'm not doing this just to do it. Like I'm not following God for the sake of following him. There has to be a reward at the end of this and it needs to be a tangible uh, reward. Would anybody else agree with that? Yeah. Third concept. I'm going to push on that tonight and we're going to challenge that. Um, much of what you said is true and we're going to dig a little bit deeper into it. Um, when we talk about this mountain has to move. There are three texts that we're going to be studying over the next few weeks. Um, I wanted to break it down that way. I almost was like, man, I want to read all of them all at once because it's like they're really connected and it's so good. But I think it would do us a disservice. So I want to kind of take it piece by piece and deal with each one of them and their own particular aspects, although they're all connected. And we're gonna be studying in the gospels, okay? Um, the gospels, um, as we know, are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the gospels. These are the times when Jesus was walking in his earthly ministry and he was teaching the 12 disciples and he was doing a lot of different things. He was doing a lot of demonstrations, a lot of miracles, but his most important thing was he was trying to give us the essence of the kingdom. What was it all about? What is it that my father, why did he send me? What am I here for? What am I doing? Right? So that we would be able to walk out life just as Yeshua has done, and we would be able to obtain that which the Heavenly Father intended. Not what we've made up, not what feels good to us, not what um, sounds right. It is what he intended. He did not create the entire um opportunity of reuniting with him for our own individual purposes us knowing god him sending yeshua is not for siobhan there's an ultimate plan it's not for stephanie no there's an ultimate plan that he has and his plan is massive for the entire creation all that he created and in the midst of that we get the opportunity as we are walking out life to connect with the risen savior, to walk in his love and experience his love that goes beyond the boundaries that we've set as humans. It was very, 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 very awesome and incredible. Um, somebody has music. I'm going to ask you to please mute your music, although I love it and it sounds really, really awesome. Ah. Um, all right. So the this mountain has to move. Also, a lot of times when we talk about this mountain has to move, we go directly to faith. We go directly to faith, right? And faith is something that the scripture says without it, it's impossible to please God. Why would that be? Well, faith is our direct connection with God. It's how we even stand on his principles to know that he is. We've never seen him. We've never seen Yeshua. But there's evidence throughout time that encourages our faith. And it comes by hearing about what he's done, hearing about his, his, um, his dying, burial, and resurrection. We've heard about it, and through hearing it, the faith inside of us that God's deposited in us, it strengthens itself. It's not our own faith. It's not what we've conjured. 
It's not what we give in ourselves. No, faith comes from God. And it comes from hearing about God. <laughs> All right. Um, and the scripture tells us that how much faith do we need? Mustard seed. Mustard seed of faith. Now to each one of us is given a measure, mm -hmm. right? Each one of us is given a measure of faith. God has distributed that. Right. And he's given us faith. And it's it's for us to go back to God to allow him to say, yes, Father, I surrender to you. I will do whatever you ask me to do through obedience. I'm activating your the faith that you have given to me. OK, so I'm just laying down a little bit of groundwork and I hope it's helpful. I'm yeah. um, and trying to connect the dots. Um what is the object of our faith? What's the object of our faith? Do y'all understand what I'm asking? Come on, come on. Where is our faith focused? I just answered that. Jesus. Our faith That's is God. in God. Yeah. His Earth death, burial, and resurrection, and he's coming back again. Right. That's where our faith is focused, the object, meaning our focus. When we think about faith, our focus should be God and God only. Mm -hmm. Our faith is not the object of our faith cannot be what we want. The object of our faith cannot be what we think. The object of our faith can't be focused on this world and getting as much as we can. And that's where our faith is. The object of our faith is not self-manifestation. That's back to me. Meaning my faith works and comes from me. No, it doesn't. The object of my faith is God. It starts with God speaks first. Man hears and agrees second. And then man obeys. God speaks Man hears and agrees with what God has said and man obeys. We see this throughout the scripture over and over again, but sometimes we've missed it. We've missed it. And we're going to go deal with some of those passages of scripture where he says, if you speak to the mountain, this mountain shall be moved. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about that and what that really means. Because a lot of us have been taught, inclusive of myself, that me speaking to that mountain is if I get in a situation that's a little bit difficult, I can speak to it and that thing got to go. Mm -hmm. Do we believe that? Good question. Good question. <laughs> I'm telling y'all, as I was studying this, I'm going, God, you're blowing the top off of my brain right now. <laughs> you're blowing the top off of my brain because what we have been given over time in, in this country that we're, we grew up in, many of us, is that our faith is so that we can get what we want. That's what faith is. Yeah, it's part that I believe in God. Yeah, that, that that's a little bit of faith. But most of our faith every day is exercised in if something gets in my way, I can speak to that thing by faith. Boom, it is mine. If I want it, I can have it. That's the limitations of our faith. We're going to read over the next couple of weeks and we're going to see what the word of God has to say about this. Um, any comments thus far before I move on? Oh, and I also wanted to share, um, and you can read this on your own, 1 Corinthians 13, 2, and I'm just pulling this part out of it where it says faith with that, um, you can, it's a listing of things, but it says basically you can have faith, but if there is no love, you are nothing. So that leads me to believe wow, God, maybe this faith has more to do with something else and not so much to do with what I've been focused on. 
Interesting. Because for me, if faith has to do with me getting what I proclaim that I'm supposed to have and you honoring that, then why is it that I need love for that? Mm. I don't need love for that. I see it. I want it. I say it. I should have it. I don't need love for that, right? Why would I need love? It began to challenge my thought. So I'm going to give you the first text that we're going to read is Matthew 17. Matthew 17. There's a series of things that's going on in Matthew 17, and we're going to walk through it like we normally do. Um, I want to ask or invite you all to join in because in getting to know the things of God and making sure that the soul of your heart is correct, you got to participate. I can't do that for you. You got to participate. And so, and you got to study and you got to read the word just like I'm reading the word. And I hope that I'm demonstrating how this all walks out and works, man. I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to be a living epistle walking before you the way that Christ has established for us to walk, that we will obtain what he wants for us to obtain. And some of these lessons are really, really challenging. Some of these teachings are really pressing on the, the corners and curves of our hearts and things that we are foundational principles. And, and we're just like, ah, what in the world, God? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's for mm -hmm. our benefit. It's for our growth. It's so that we will look like Yeshua. Jesus. We're imitating him. These are the essence of his teachings. So let's go to Matthew 17. And I'm going to ask some people to read if you would not mind to read um, tonight. And we'll do just like we did um, in the past couple of weeks. You read a little bit. We discuss it because it's too much to try to break out in one sitting. We cannot eat the whole pie. We have to take it portion by portion to really understand and digest what the word of God is saying to us. And I want us to discuss it. It's through us walking together that we're able to gain wisdom and understanding. All right. Um, I also want to pin this question on the hinges of your hearts and your minds. How do I know if God spoke to me? Put that in the back of your mind. How do I know if God spoke to me? Because remember, like I said, the beginning of this is God speaks first. Man hears it and agrees with it. And then he obeys. But how do I know? It starts with that. How do I know when God said something? Our faith is not, i say it again, it is not just going off of Siobhan and herself can just say something and declare it and God just does it. Mm -hmm. No, doesn't work like that. Many of us know that as manifestation in this, in, these, in this day and time, the young people are coming up and they're saying, I can just manifest it if I say it and if I sit in it, I can draw it to myself. That is not scripture. The only way we obtain things as children of God is our father, our heavenly father must have already spoken it and established it for us. Question is, how do I know if he said that though? How do I know? And we'll come back around to that. Just put that in the back of your mind or write it down. Write it down. Because over the next few weeks, we're going to be pondering that. Matthew 17. When we get to 20 and 21, we'll focus in a little bit more. But let's read the whole entire text. I like to read the whole text because it is not proper to just take out, which we've seen demonstrated. We take out small portions of the scripture and we try to understand the massive lesson in it all. It's almost like taking one sentence out of a conversation and then trying to make some sense of it. There's no way possible in doing that. People come away with a whole lot of different definitions and understandings in that way. And that is a lot of what we see demonstrated. 
um, in today, in our news, on social media. We edit out clips of what someone said and then we try to make it fit to our scenario. We no longer want to do that with the word of God. We want to know exactly what he meant. Father, what are you saying? And how do we know that? We got to read all of it. Hallelujah. We have to read all of it. Amen. I'm sorry about that, guys. Uh, we have to read all of it. Um, who wants to read? Can I get somebody to read one through five, please? I can read, read one. one. Go for it, India. Okay. India is going to read one through five. All right. Who's going to read six through 11? Or six, yeah, six through one through five. Yep, six through 11. I can. Thank you. I'm sorry, y'all. Let me respond to this. Okay. Um, six to eleven is Layla. All right. Who can read six to eleven? Uh, da, 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 da. Who can read twelve through sixteen for us? Twelve through sixteen. Steph, thank you so much. Who can read seventeen through twenty for us? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, through 21 but this particular version leaves out 21 so I can capture that um because I want us to read 21 mm -hmm. um who said they can read that I'm sorry well, I said I can read it the 17 to the 20 yeah oh I thought you were reading the first one through five no I am. Okay, 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 okay. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Then. Anybody? Uh, okay. Seven things to twenty. Cool. And I'll read twenty-one through twenty-seven. I'll read the rest. All right. Um. Yeah, we got to get twenty-one because for for whatever reason they did not read that portion in here. So. Or place that in here. So let us start. And this is the new international version that we are reading. And it starts talking about the transfiguration. Um, India, please start, love. Okay. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Verse four, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be, to be here if you wish. I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. All right, what do you think that's saying to us? Um, I think that it was the Holy Spirit, um, that was, um, just on Jesus. I mean, you know, we you know he's Holy Spirit. Like he was speaking because he, he was the bright light. If this was, let me see, hold on. Let me take my time. Take your time, honey. <laughs> so this is after um after he um died on the cross and then the, he came and visit is it i'm saying the sixth day just took for him oh no Mm. 
So the so Don King. I don't know. That's when I guess when that's when um a, a transfer happened. Okay. The Holy Spirit. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody want to help her? What 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 do we see going on in here? The first five verses. Thank you, India. Mm -hmm. Cause this is what it's all about. It's not a it's not a right or wrong necessarily trying to figure it out. It's really seeking the Holy Spirit as to what is He saying to us. This is what you got to do at home when you're reading your scripture. You can't just read through it. We got to know and really seek God about what is he saying to us. That's what we all are here for. So I'm so grateful for this platform that helps us to really search out the scripture so that we can walk in truth and not walk on, you know, what we've been told or even what we assume. Anybody want to help? One through five. Um, interesting that Moses and Elijah were there. Okay. Um, being that they were, well, Elijah didn't die. God carried him out, you know, in a chariot of fire, <laughs> but Moses did die. Um, so the, like, it's an important, um, I think of a holy moment, right? Yeah. Um, at least that's what I envision in my head. Yep. Uh, and then a bright cloud covered them, you know, um, you know, almost like God, because no one has ever seen, you know, just a cloud, you know, his glory with Moses and a cloud. Um, I, I see that. And then I'm um, him announcing, this is my son, you know, like I'm, when we introduce our, our children, we're just so proud of them. And I can see, you know, I, I just, in my head, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased listen to you know almost like a grand introduction in front of like this holy scene taking place um with the covering of the lord and then moses and elijah um being there that's kind of what i imagine in my head yeah um a scene taking place um and that and the lord speaking the father speaking um there so now remember it says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Now, when Jesus came up on that scene, was had they ever seen the glorious side of Jesus? No. No. He was born in a manger. This is what they know. Uh -huh. Right. So you got to think, you got to go back to that space, right? It's, this is what they know. He, he was a baby born to a woman who was married to a man, but this baby wasn't from this man. It, it was all confusing. They, they didn't know what to make of all of this. Right? So now Jesus is inviting them. I, I look at this as an invitation. Jesus inviting Peter, James, J and John, the brother of James, mm -hmm. up to the mountain and something's about to happen. Uh-huh. Something they've never really seen before, but they don't really know what to expect or anticipate because God went to the, Jesus went to the mountain often. He went to the mountain right. to pray, right? They were up in the mountain doing different things. You got the, the you know, I think Gethsemane was a mountain. I don't know. There's all these things. I read about the mountains earlier today. So the Mount of Olives, you know, they got all these right. things, mountainous place. So they're accustomed to that. So they weren't thinking of anything necessarily, I guess, out of the ordinary, at least the way it seems. Mm -hmm. but something was about to happen so after six days jesus took with him peter james and john the brother of james and led them up a high mountain by themselves well there was 12 disciples my question was well god why did you just choose these brothers yeah mm -hmm. there was something about to happen something that he wanted them to see because mm -hmm. he took them by themselves mm -hmm. No one else. Uh -huh. There like he was transfigured before them. What does transfigured mean? He was, that was when the Holy hey. Spirit, he was transitioned, like the Holy Spirit um, revealed. He was changed. Right. Changed. Yeah, changed. Yeah, changed Holy from Spirit. what? The Holy Spirit. Hey. To a spirit, right? 
They saw his glorious being because he mm -hmm. was in human flesh at the moment. Right. He was in a, in a human body. Mm -hmm. Wow. So imagine that. You oh. go, you with your friend. We can use us. Say we walking and we're out in the park and all of a sudden one of us just starts glowing, glowing. Just mm. illuminating before <laughs> us and our clothes become white as light. Right. Yeah. You'll be like, yeah. What in what? the world is going uh -huh. on? Uh -huh. Because remember, as Jesus was telling them, Yeshua had been telling them all about who he was, where he come from, because they had all kinds of questions. Uh -huh. Remember, they were thinking he was a whole different king. He was going to come a whole different way. And he basically comes this meek, subtle way. He looks more impoverished. They don't know what's going on. Mm. they're trying to live walk this out with him that's why they always had all these questions because they were like this is something we don't, we don't know nothing about this and this is not what was foretold to us mm. we were not expecting this mm. and I feel like that's much like us because a lot of what has been passed down to us is not what was in this book is not what's in this book so we would have that same response like, whoa, wait a minute. That is not what I thought. And that's what they were. They were like, that's not what we thought about Jesus and who he is. He's supposed to be a king. Right. But the kings that we know, they are royal. They are glorious. They have on crowns and they have servants and they have all these things. And Jesus did not have all of that. He had no even not didn't even have a place to lay his head. Right. So his right. face shone like the sun His and his clothes became a, as white as the light. And then just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Wait a minute. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out. These people are no longer existent in the earth realm from what we know. Right. Where they come from. How does this happen? So you can just imagine, I'm just trying to set the scene of what Peter, James, and John was really thinking like, what is happening right now? Mm -hmm. But Jesus was giving them an opportunity to experience him in his glory. He's given us the same opportunity. Amen. Experience me in all of my glory. Not what you thought I was, not who you, you assumed I would be, but I want to show you who I really am. Mm. Moses and Elijah have been gone years. Right. Right? That's what it, it the little yep. um, scripture, it, they have been gone years mm -hmm. before. All right. Um, it says this scene then informs us that those who experience death, Moses have cognitive understanding and ability to communicate. Together they symbolize all those who make up God's kingdom, those who will be raptured and not see death like Elijah, and those who will die and go to be with the Lord like Moses. All right. So we're seeing some really amazing dynamics that's happening. And it's almost like a foretelling as well of what will come mm. because in in their minds and much like in our minds Moses and Elijah they're dead like how are they even here but to me yeah. it's a foretelling of the promise that no they're still their spirits are still reigning um with the with the lord mm. and they appear here yeah. Talking with Jesus. So Peter said to Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. 
Now I could be wrong about this, but to me, Peter's trying to make sense of what's going on. Because if he really understood that Jesus was showing himself in his fullness and glory, then why would he need a shelter? Mm. That doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to read through this. It says, moreover, Moses represented the law and Elijah represented the prophets. Together, they represented the complete Old Testament. Along with the disciples, they represent both the Old and New Testament centered on Jesus. To me, God was doing a foretelling of allowing all of this to happen right before their very eyes. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son. That voice is God, the father. Mm -hmm. Our heavenly father interrupts Peter. Almost to say, hey, 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 focus, focus. <laughs> yeah. A bright cloud covers them. And a voice from the cloud says, this is my son whom I love. He's like answering all of their questions right now. Mm -hmm. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. Because Jesus had been telling them and teaching them. He had been showing them the ways of the father, but some things they were not getting. And they were hearing from the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were the studiers of the law of that day. And they knew what the law said, but they weren't doing what the law told them to do because they didn't even believe that the Messiah had come. There's a bunch of confusion right. going on. And right here to me, God steps into the scene and he answers these guys' questions by saying, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. We'll see this again when Jesus um, was baptized by John the Baptist. God says the same thing as the dove in the and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove comes down to ascend upon Jesus. Mm -hmm. But God comes in and he says, listen to him. All right. Any questions on that? This is such a powerful moment that's taking place before mm -hmm. these guys' eyes. It wasn't just something to pass over. Mm-hmm. They are literally seeing a miracle happen before their eyes. Jesus is turning into a spirit. <laughs> All right, who's supposed to read six through, I think, 11? I'm next. All right. Um, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the son of man has been raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. The disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah comes, to be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things. Um, okay. I'm going to read 12. I know whoever's supposed to read 12. I think Steph, I'm going to read that right now and 13 just to close this off. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the son of man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. What do you see? What sticks out to you, Layla? Sorry, I'm like reading over it right quick. That's okay. I know. It's a lot to absorb. So yes. we're taking our time.
so they Jesus said that Elijah has already come but they don't recognize him so that kind of makes me think of how as you were mentioning earlier like they kind of not underestimated Jesus but they were expecting him to look a certain way and come in a certain way um and of course yep. Jesus has different sides to him so of course he can come in holy light and all of that but I think they're just not used to um the true form of Jesus and of Elijah. So that sticks out to me. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Anything else that's good? Anything else? I love how um, in verse seven, it says Jesus touched them because we see, we see a different part of God's character. Just right above, we saw God or Jesus being in all of his glory, like mighty and powerful. And yet a verse down, like his tender heart, like he touched them and said, get up, don't be afraid. Like, um, so God is mighty and powerful, but at the same time, like he's tender and gentle as well. So that just, that really he, good. He, he and he's them. near and he's yeah. near. Like, although God is holy and God is majestic and he's powerful, he is not so much that he would not come down to us as mere humans and touch us and be near to us and rid us of all of our fears. Yeah. I think that sticks out to me. When they heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. Well, well, too, that lets me know they weren't accustomed to hearing the voice of God. It scared them. Mm -hmm. And that's not a bad thing against them. All of this seemingly was new. Mm -hmm. And it's not that God hadn't spoken because we see different accounts in the scripture where God spoke to different people. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this was all a lot for the, for the disciples to absorb in their, in their flesh, which is the same as us. Mm -hmm. There's so much to God. There's so many sides to God. And as I was studying this, that's what I was coming away with. Like, God, oh my gosh, you are so vast. You're, you're too, too much for us to comprehend. Yeah. You got to help us. Great. But they fell on their faces down and they were terrified. And Jesus in his glory, he stood back and said, whoa. Yeah. All right, we're going to get you. Can I, oh, Get up. Don't, oh, be don't be afraid. Get up. Don't be afraid. Deanna, oh, your mic is on. I'm sorry. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Mm -hmm. And as they were coming down the mountain, now they're leaving from this amazing demonstration. Jesus instructs them. He gives them instructions. And remember, go back. God speaks first. Man hears and agrees and obeys. Mm -hmm. We're going to see this demonstrated over and over again, by the way, as we go through these different texts. Mm -hmm. It jumped out to me. Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the son of man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? This is what I was just saying. It's much like us. There are preachers and teachers and, and scribes in our day that have taught us so many things and it's confused and we're going to wait, but that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. That's what they were saying. Why are they telling us Elijah got to come first if you are the Messiah? why mm -hmm. they keep saying that and Jesus replied to be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things but I tell you Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him but have done to him everything they wished in the same way the son of man is going to suffer at their hands then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist it's like Layla said, again, this is like to me a foreshadowing of what was going to happen to Yeshua, what they were going to do to him. They didn't recognize him. Mm -hmm. 
They didn't realize he was the Messiah. He was the coming king. John the Baptist had already foretold of his coming and now he is with them. They didn't get that. John the Baptist was the one that was born to tell that the coming king was coming. And even with him telling, people were like, well, I'm disciples of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was like, no, you need to follow the one I'm telling you about. Mm -hmm. Like follow him, be his disciple. Any questions or anything else so far? Is everybody following? I will take that as a yes. Um, so I read 12 and 13. We're going to shift everybody down a little bit. So Steph, if you could start at 14 and go ahead and you can read to 19 or yeah, 19 is good. Okay. All right. When they reached, reached the crowd, a man approached and knelt down before him. Lord, he said, have mercy on my son because he has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Jesus replied, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Hmm. How long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And from that moment, the boy was healed. Then the disciples approached Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we drive it out? Woo! We're coming up on the good stuff. All right. What do you get? What are y'all hearing? Mm. Remember, they're on the way down the mountain. Right? They're going back down to where everyone mm -hmm. else is. And this man approaches. Go ahead, Steph. What are, what are you getting? Well, they were on the mountain with God. They were on um, the mountain with God. <laughs> and saw the, the glory um, of Jesus. And then um, then they encounter a demon. Yeah. Um, so just, uh, again, um, I love how the man approached G uh, Jesus. Know, and said, have mercy on my son um, because he has seizures, you know, um, I, I like that part. And then um, he often falls into the fire and into the water. I I don't really, uh, I don't know if that's meant to be there just as, I don't know if there's any significance there with the fire and the water, um, but those two words stand out to me. Mm -hmm. um, And then, uh, you know, Jesus, um, I don't think he's saying, you know, I don't know, maybe he is saying it harsh. I, I can't really tell, but, you know, how he's asking, you know, questions, you unbelieving people and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? Wow. Like, that's an attention getter. Yeah. Um, pay attention. <laughs> um, and then he, he uh, heals the boy. The demon goes out. And then I think uh, this is where the faith comes in because the disciples said, you know, why couldn't we drive it out? Why couldn't we do what you're doing, Lord? Um, but yeah, it's, it's good. Anyone else got any, any observations, anything you guys want to talk about that sticks out in this particular part? Um, when I read that, um, when the disciples came to Jesus and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? My first thought was like, I mean, because you're not Jesus. I mean, <laughs> you guys, <laughs> you got the powers you got. But I read a little bit more and, and Jesus said, it's because you have so little faith. And I was like, oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So I guess we all possess, um, not all of us possess some of that, but like just having faith um, is important. Well, you're right. All of us have faith. He says to each one of us was given a measure of faith. We all have faith. And we all are to be doing what Jesus is doing. 
right? He says, greater work shall you do. We, we're all to be doing these things. But, but listen, let's go back a little bit. So when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire and into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Jesus and these disciples are coming down off the mountain. They've just experienced this miraculous a, a encounter or occurrence, right? And then um, as they're walking down, this man recognizes them and he comes and he kneels down before Jesus. Yes. To me, that is exemplifying or echoing or confirming the glory that is upon Jesus. Mm -hmm. That that he just allowed the disciples to see. Because mm -hmm. now he's going back down with everyone else. And there's a lot of hearsay about who he is and what he's able to do and all these things. Some people have seen some demonstrations. Some people have not. They've only heard certain things. But this guy jumps out there. Mm -hmm. And he kneels down before Jesus. And he begins to pour his heart out and say, Lord, have mercy on my son. Like my son, something's not right with him. He's having seizures and he's suffering. And, 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 those, and, and, and whatever it is, it's throwing him into the fire and it's throwing him into the water. And I brought him into to your disciples, but they couldn't do nothing. They couldn't do anything. It's interesting to me because it speaks back to who we are as followers of Christ. That when people see us, because we say that we're followers of Christ, the expectation is that we are able to do as Christ has done. Mm -hmm. That we're walking in his power, not in our own power. But in his power, and as you all, and as I go and throughout the days and we're doing different things, when people see you, guess what? That's what they're expecting because you say you've been with the Messiah. Not that you're Jesus. Like Layla's like, well, they want Jesus. But the same that's in him, in Jesus, God has also given that to us, but it's through Jesus. Again, the object of our faith and our power and who we are comes from God and God alone. Mm -hmm. But what we have done in being such a wicked people and full of sin, we've tried to separate that from God. So now we think we can do it on our own. And that's what this is demonstrating. Without Jesus, these disciples couldn't do nothing. Mm, it's true. They couldn't do it. They could not do it. Now, Jesus is with them. It's giving us, to me, that physical demonstration of with God, all things are possible. It's a precursor to that, which we're going to see later down in the scripture. But without God, you can't do nothing. That's why they pointed that out. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And then Jesus comes and says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. I feel like that question is being asked of us right now. How long, y'all? How long do we have to read about, about Jesus? How long do we have to, to, to um, stand and believe that he's here, but we refuse to step out and trust him in the things that he desires of us and in that which he in, in deposited inside of you? How long are you going to be stricken with fear? 
How long? You unbelieving and perverse generation. Perverse here is meaning you don't believe what God has said. You don't believe it. Go back up. What did God say? This is my son whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. But we aren't listening. Mm -hmm. Even in 2023, we are not listening to God. What was that question I said, put in the back of your mind? How do I know if God spoke to me? Well, he says, my sheep know my voice. Well, how do I know his voice? I spend time with them. I went up on the mountain with them. I saw him transfigured. I've seen him in all of his holiness. I know who he is. Can we say that? I know who he is because I've been with him. I've sat with him. Not I know who he is because I got a new car last week and got approved. That's great. But how do you know you've been with the king of kings and the Lord of lords? How do you know? One thing about it, this shares with us that something should change. Something should happen in your life. You should have some fruit going on in, inside of you. Bring the boy to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy. And he was healed at that moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? So now their, their wheels are spinning. What in the world? Why? Standing beside Jesus, standing around other Christians, standing in the church, reading the scriptures only. That doesn't mean that the power of God is resting in your life. You must have an encounter with God. You must be transfigured just as he was through the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit must rest in you, burn away all of the things and the impurities out of your life that you may be filled. Mm -hmm. The disciples were with Jesus, but they still couldn't do as he had done. Mm -hmm. But God's desire is that we reign with Christ. That that which is inside of Christ is also in us, but it takes us doing what the father is doing. Saying what the father has said. Not stepping out here doing our own thing. We must be women of authority, under authority. Women that are servants to the most high God. And we'll see later on in, um, I think it's over in Luke, where it tells us, listen, obeying God is not, is not, you don't get no brownie points for obeying God. That's your reasonable service. Mm -hmm. That's our duty as servants of God. Sometimes we think we're supposed to get a pat on the back. Man, I heard God and I did what he said. He said, I expect you to. Not, not just, just for the sake of doing it, but because I've chosen you, called you unto myself. You're mine. You're my servant. So in being my servant, my expectation is that you obey me. And when you obey me, you're walking according to my purpose and my way. You're speaking as I am speaking. You're walking as I am walking. Then that which I have spoken comes to pass. Not just in your life, 
but in the lives of those around. Because it's what I have willed. God has a plan. He has a desire for his world. And each and every one of us that's in it is a part of that plan. Any question? Is everybody okay? I don't want to lose anybody. Are we good? Good. Yes, this is good. Mm -hmm. Real good. It's really challenging. I, I hope it's challenging y'all minds as it challenged my mind because I was like, yeah. oh, what do mm -hmm. I really believe in? Uh -huh. yeah. What have I been putting my faith in? Also asking myself, okay, so the things that I've been pinning on God for not doing, is it possibly because he never said that? Uh. It all sounded like God. It all felt like God. But then, Siobhan, do you know that it was God? Huh. It causes us to think about these things that we've got to put on automatic. God is not on automatic. You can't set him on automatic. Every single step of the way, it takes faith. Every step of the way, it takes a different openness to how God wants to handle that particular situation or person or scenario in your life. Just because he did it that way last time don't mean he's going to do it that way this time. This is an active walk. <laughs> active. You cannot go on autopilot with God. It takes trust every step. It takes faith every step. It takes knowing him daily, moment by moment, second by second. It's remembering everything belongs to him. Everything comes from him. That he is God and God alone. Beside him, there is no other. You can do nothing by yourself. You can do nothing. Which seems really simple. Try breathing on your own. Try it. Try getting yourself dressed. Try waking up in the morning without God. I don't know about you, but some mornings I can wake up and I'm like, Lord, where am I? What is happening today? Oh my God, I need God. <laughs> to me, that's what the scripture is telling us. Without mm -hmm. him, we can't do nothing. These disciples could do nothing. I'm going to read 20 and 21 because they took one part out. They took 21 out of here. It's not showing. It says, he replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from there, from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And on 21, it says, this kind. How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. What's the mountain in this text that he's talking about? The, the demon inside of the boy. The unclean spirit. The unclean spirit. He's giving them instructions. First, he answers their question. Why couldn't we do this? He says, because you got too little faith. So little faith. But then it's really interesting because he comes back and says, but it only takes a small amount. Well, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Well, it says he, they got so little. Well, he said they ain't got no faith. 
What were they supposed to be believing? Is it possible that you could be with Jesus, walk around Jesus, talk Jesus, and still not believe? Yeah. Yes, it's possible. <laughs> it's possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's possible. There's something here that the disciples were missing. Mm -hmm. They had had an encounter. Some of us think that we something because we had an encounter. Mm. Mm. That means we got a lot of work to do. We have to set our faith in the right place. It must be pointed towards God, understanding there is nothing that we have without him. Amen. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move. He's using the term mountain because mountain is something that's monumentous. Mm -hmm. Physically, it is impossible for a human to do anything with a mountain. He says, but Ooh. with him, uh, you can move it. Uh, 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 uh. Nothing will be impossible for you. I, I, I want to talk about this. Nothing will be impossible for you because many preachers and teachers have taken that nothing will be impossible for you out of context. We take that and we stamp it on almost like that staples button. That's easy. That is easy. That is easy. <laughs> You're right. But in this text, Jesus is dealing with the inner things of, of the, the boy where he could experience the freedom that God had established through Jesus Christ. As we go forward, we're going to see there are some things in our lives that cannot be moved lest we fast and pray. That's what mm -hmm. he says here. Mm -hmm. Because that mountain has been in our families for years and generations. That anger, that hatred, that unforgiveness has been in our families for years. Mm -hmm. And the demonic has established itself in it. Mm. And it's caused a, 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 um, a barrier in us, in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits to receive the things that God has established for us through Jesus. Mm. He's saying in and of yourself, you can't get rid of that habit. In and of yourself, you can't get rid of that unforgiveness and that hatred. We're going to see that in Mark and in Luke. In and of yourself, you cannot move away from those things that are sinful, but with God. Mm. That thing that was once a mountain in your life, it can be moved. And if you stay hinged upon God and upon what he wants to establish through his children, if you stay there, nothing will be impossible for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 It's challenging us to move away from this materialistic mindset that we've stamped upon the Savior. The Messiah has come not so that we can have good cars and good clothes and the job that we want and the car that we have and we can get the yes. The only reason that you get the yes is because God has something on the other side of that thing that he wants to establish in where he's sending you. Mm -hmm. 
We must transform our minds through the word of God that we can shift things. We've seen nothing because we're so limited in our thinking. This is what I feel like he's saying to the disciples. Oh, you of little faith. You ain't seen nothing because you're so limited in your thinking. You didn't even realize that the Messiah was here. I could, I, I'm here. I demonstrated this. I can show you guys. I just showed you that all power is within me. How long, how long, how long do I have to do this? Before y'all get it. Who's supposed to read 22? Any questions? Any questions or comments so far? Because I know that's a lot to chew on. All right, let's keep going. Um, Who's going to read? Can somebody read 22? I'll read 22. Uh, 22 through 22 through 20. Go ahead and read um, 22 down, Quinn. Okay. It says, when they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. And the disciples will fill with grief. Keep going. After, after Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capri Capernaum, Capernaum, uh -huh. the collectors of the two drachma, drachma. Temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he said, he, yes, he does. He replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? from their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Good, good, good. Any comments? You got anything you you put pull, pull from there? I, I I didn't. Okay. Anybody? Anybody got any comments? I'm gonna jump in. All right. So they just had another demonstration of God's power, <laughs> right? In Him, the the uh, casting the demon out of the young boy, and Him being healed immediately. Jesus is teaching them and demonstrating before them where they kind of, why this didn't work for them. And then he reassures them that with God, all things are possible. If they stay focused and really get God's perspective, they can do anything. So when they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. He's again, once again, foretelling them warning them of what would come. Jesus does this to us as well. Right now, he will forewarn us of what's to come, give us instruction on what to do and how to address it. But many times we're missing the warnings and we're missing the instruction. God speaks first, man hears and agrees, and then we are to obey. He says they will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. This is still a display of the disciples still not quite getting it. Because they were focused in on they're going to kill him. They're going to kill him. And not so much that I probably would be like, what do you mean on the third day you coming back to life? More so than you're going to get killed. You coming back to life? But they were filled with grief. 
After Jesus and the disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma, drachma was just a form of coin that they used there. It was their money. Um, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax, two drachma temple tax. Let me make sure I'm telling y'all that right. Drachma. I believe that was their money. I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting, Layla. It says a former monetary unit of Greece. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> Notionally equal to 100 lepta, replaced in 2002 by the euro, a silver coin of ancient Greece. There you go. All right. Um, your little history lesson as you are headed to Greece. <laughs> <laughs> so the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Because remember, they were always trying to find some way to clip Jesus up. Always trying to figure out something. Always trying to question who he was and what he was doing and, and who gave him the authority and all of this stuff, you know, which many of us experience now too. All right. Peter says, yes. He does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? Simon is Peter. He asked, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? First of all, you gotta know that he is some special, that I'm outside somewhere else. And then soon as Peter comes in the house, Jesus asked me about this temple tax. Like, it's so much that was going on, but to me, Jesus was paying attention to every single detail and he was making a, a um, point to teach them even about the practical things of their day. So after Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors came and they went straight to Peter. As soon as Peter came in the house, Jesus addresses it. What do you think, Simon? He asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt. Jesus said to them, but so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Once again, Jesus is doing such a powerful demonstration. What do y'all think this was demonstrating to them? No wrong answers. Come on. Uh, I like the way, um, can you hear me, Siobhan? Can you guys? I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I, um, I like the way Jesus, they were fishermen. So it's just so like Jesus to, you know, like go to the lake and throw out a line and, and there's money inside the fish's mouth, which is amazing in itself. Um, a miracle, um, but they're fishermen. Uh, like I, that he just speaks to you know people, to pe people in the Bible and to us, like in ways that we can relate to. Um, so what what do I think that he is like the the point? Um, like, I think it's a miracle. I think it's crazy that he found money in a fish, in a, in a fish's mouth. And, you know, with God, all things are possible. Like he um, He's demonstrating once again that with me, you can do the impossible. Yeah. He's also what's sticking out to me is that 
when he's asking this question, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes from their own children or from others? To me, this is almost like another parallel with God being our father and him taking care of us. He doesn't, he's, he's not going to tax his children. But it says from others. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we don't cause any fuss because we're in this earthly realm, we're not going to cause no fuss. Go to the fish. This is where he said, go to what you know. Right. I'm taking you to something that's familiar and I'm getting ready to do something that you've never seen before because with me, all things are possible. Jesus was powerful enough that where he was sitting, he could have said, here you go, here's four drachma coin, go pay our taxes. But he gave him an instruction and in that instruction, Peter was able to experience God in his fullness once again. Yeah. What does that say to us? By chance, the things that we're going through and we're experiencing, it don't have nothing to do with you. It don't have anything to do with getting money to you. It don't have nothing to do with feeding you and your family, but God using every single scenario in your life that you may see and demonstrate his power that without him, nothing is possible for you. And the reason why I'm using the things that I'm using is because I want it to be in your language that you already know and are familiar with. So when the impossible happens, you automatically know this ain't normal. This ain't, this ain't how this happens like this. So I know that God is with me. I know that God is here. And it wasn't just for Peter to see, but the other disciples were able to experience this miracle as well. God is so wonderful, so phenomenal. We put him in this little, little box and category like he only could do certain things for certain purposes. Listen, he said, if I could take care of the very lilies of the field and, and they're dressed, neither one, um, I mean, he said, he said um, King Solomon wasn't dressed better than in, any one of these. But if I could do that, don't you think I'll take care of you? Don't you think that I will be, give you every single thing that you need? So with that being said, every single thing in our lives don't have to do with how we gonna eat and drink and, and where we gonna sleep and God's got those things. But he wants us to understand and see the fullness of who he is from the father's perspective to know that he can do the impossible things, those things that's been holding you bound. Remember, Jesus came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The word says, he whom the son has set free is free indeed. God is concerned about your freedom. Yes, he'll add all these other things. If you delight yourself in him, he'll let you experience the fullness of the land and the fat of the land. He'll allow you to experience those things, but that is not why he is in your life. He didn't just come that you can have a peachy king life. That we can have everything that we want and we can just say it and it comes to us he didn't die on the cross for that. He came because our heavenly father had an, a plan in mind and he had an idea of what he wanted and he wanted us to know who he is. He wanted us to experience his love. He wanted us to be free from all of the sin of the world and he wanted us to know that with him, 
We are no longer bound to sin because he made it possible. Thank you, Jesus, for that revelation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm pushing on us. And this is just the beginning. It also, we, we walk through it, but I also want to put a thing here that he equipped us with something and he was giving us the tip for those of us that have not embraced fasting and prayer. That is one of your tools. You want to see some things break free in the lives of other people and in your own life, you got to start fasting and praying. You want strongholds to be broken? You want demons to stop tormenting you and your children and your friends and your family? You gotta start fasting and praying. He's given us the tools that we need. He's helping us to be successful in this life because ultimately he cares. And he loves you. And he's demonstrating the love that he has for us. All you need is a mustard seed of faith to begin to see the miraculous power of God through Jesus in your life. I challenge you Ask God to do something that only he can do. Come away from the material things. Some of you are struggling with strongholds and you've been struggling with them since your childhood. Some of you have been struggling with different addictions and you've been struggling with them for years. Some of you silently and some of you have exposed it to other people. Test out the word of God. Try him. We will partner with you as your sisters. Why? Because we want to see you free. What sense does it make to follow a Jesus that says he will bring freedom into your life and you spend your entire life bound? You spend your entire life tormented. No, nah, man, that's not what God intended. That's not what he intended. God desires to bring freedom. He desires for you to be whole. Fully, fully, fully wrapped and draped in his love. Knowing his voice. Knowing when he's spoken. Ready to obey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We glorify you for your goodness tonight and what you've given us. Oh, it's such a precious gift. Father, I pray tonight in the name of the most high God. Father, every single thing that has been binding your daughters. Those things that are spoken and those things that have not been spoken. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will begin to shake them off of us. Father God, I pray that freedom will fall upon your daughters now in the name of Jesus. Father, we know that it's not possible in and of ourselves. And some of us have been trying to rid it ourselves. We've been trying to do it our own way. We've been trying to do these programs and formats, God. But you are the one that we got to start with. 
and what has been impossible with man now becomes possible with you. Father, we totally surrender. Show us where you've been speaking. Confirm it in us that it's you talking to us. Show us in your word, God. Because whatever you tell us, you'll confirm it in your word. You allow your peace to rest upon us. And you'll send other people also to confirm and reaffirm that you're speaking. God, I pray you would make yourself known to your daughters, God. Deliver us from every single weight that has so easily beset us and that the enemy has set up against us. He set up dark traps where we have become blinded in different areas of our lives. We cannot see you anymore in those areas. Father, bring freedom in the name of the Lord Jesus. We plead your blood tonight, God, upon your daughters. We plead your blood. I pray, Father, that you would deliver us. Deliver us, O oh God. Deliver us. We lift our hands in full surrender to you. And we say, yes, yes, Lord. We will do it your way. We repent, oh God. We turn away from the things that we have, we have fallen prey to, God. We repent and turn away from them, Lord Jesus. Forgive us, God, that we turned you into our personal vending machines. God, forgive us that we made you our Santa Claus. God, instead of making you our Messiah and our King and our Savior. Help us, Father. Help us to see you in the fullness of your glory. Help us, Lord Jesus, to walk in confidence, knowing that you're with us and you're for us. And every single thing that's inside of us that don't align to how you have created us according to your plan, God, we pray you will remove it. Every ounce of stinking thinking, Lord, remove it, Lord God. Words that we've spoken, that we know are against you. Father, remove them. We repent, Lord Jesus. We repent, God. We cry out to you tonight. We repent, Lord Jesus. We want the fullness of your glory in our lives, Lord. We want to be whole. We want to be made new. We want to be restored, oh God. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. Glory to who you are, Lord. Bless your holy name. We honor you, Father. We adore you. We lift you up. We bless you for being so thoughtful. We bless you for being so mindful. We thank you, Lord God, for keeping us from destroying ourselves, keeping us from partnering with the evil one who only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. For freeing us from throwing ourselves into the fire, the pit, from drowning ourselves in the things of the world. Thank you for saving us. For commanding every spirit that is not the Holy Spirit. Get out of our lives. Every spirit that's been reigning, every spirit of fear and anxiousness and self-doubt. Get out of our lives in the name of the Lord Jesus. For we are made in the image of the Most High God. Every dependency 
Every spirit that has caused us to be dependent on everything else except for God in his fullness. Get out of our lives in the name of Jesus. You're not welcome here. Holy Spirit, fill us up that the devil will no longer take advantage of us. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. We bless you, oh God. Glorify your name. Glorify your name. Hallelujah. If by chance that is you, there's things in your life that's been holding you in shackles. Lift your hands before the Lord. Surrender it fully to him. Repent for those things that you need to repent for. And ask the Lord God to wash you and cleanse you. That you may be filled with his spirit now. Hallelujah. Glory. To your name, Lord. And this is where we activate our faith. That the word of God says that he whom the son is set free is free indeed. So we believe it by faith. That that which you've submitted over to God and that which you've surrendered to him. God has made it possible that it will no longer hold you up nor hold you hostage that you are free indeed. Father, we come in agreement with what you have established for our lives. And we say that we will obey you. We will do what you ask us to do. For it is through our obedience that we're able to see you every day, every moment of the day, working in us and through us, that your plan may be fulfilled. Thank you for this word. I pray, Father, that it, that it will take root in our hearts, that the enemy will not pluck it up, nor pull it out, nor choke it, but it will blossom and produce great fruit in our lives. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor. Hallelujah. In the name of Yahushua, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Bless Lord. The Lord. Amen. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Lord. God is so good to us. He's faithful. He's faithful in every single way, every day, every day. And I believe that whatever you prayed for, whatever you submitted before God, it is so. We don't just say it with our mouths, but we believe it. And our faith activates it, that God has done it. If it's according to his will, it is so. Hallelujah. I want to give you a chance if there's anything that anyone else would like to share or say before we close tonight, um, feel free to share now. Anyone, anything you want to say or you feel like the Lord has spoken to you in this time or experienced anything? Well, God moved quick on my behalf. This is Queen. I got a hearing on the 26th. Um, so just prayers that everything um, 
it's God's will. I don't, I don't want more to be on me, more favor for me, more favor for him. I just want God to do his thing this week. Amen. It is so. Um, we already know it's a miracle that you have God's perspective. Because <laughs> most of us would only want what we want. So we believe God's going to do it. Hallelujah. Anyone else? This is Keisha. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I was on an appointment, so I couldn't read along, but I had my earbuds in listening, and thank you so much for the prayer. It was so necessary. Thank you. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Anyone else? If there's nothing else, bless the Lord. We're we'll so say praying. thank you. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, baby. Say thank you, Sharon, for your teaching tonight. You gave me a new perspective um, in that scripture. Of, sorry. You gave me a new pers uh, perspective in the scripture of Matthew. So I thank you for your revelation and your teaching and your prayers tonight. Appreciate you. Hallelujah. Amen. You saying something, Stephanie? No, yeah, I'm in agreement with India. It was, thank you, Mr. Bond. It was good. It was, it was good. Hallelujah. As I was preparing, I was very, very nervous. Not, not very nervous, but I was kind of like, Lord, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> yeah. But I think it's good. I know it's going to be good. The next couple of weeks, um, We'll send it out, but go back, listen to this again. I'll post it up on YouTube. And I hope that you guys are going back, watching some of the lessons on YouTube um, and just letting it wash over you again. Um, man, we just want to be the best representatives of God, King, God's kingdom here on the earth as we can be. Um and be conduits of his love and grace to all. So we're going to also read um, in the next couple of weeks, Mark 11 and Luke 17 as well. So if you guys have nothing else, bless you. Please don't forget the women's retreat. Um, pray because today I've had some, I don't know, man, just some challenges about Lord, you know, I'm doing this by faith. It's the same thing. I'm doing it by faith. Um, show me what you want. Show me where you want us to be. And so um, please, please remember that. Please remember to register. Um, for those of you that are having concerns financially, man, I'm just like, do what you can do and let's walk forward from there. I believe God's going to meet us. Um, and that's not some hocus pocus. I really do. I just believe he's going to meet us. I don't know how he's going to meet us, but I believe he's going to meet us. Um, if you just, we just do our part, just obey whatever he's telling us to do. Um, so I really put that before you. One last thing as I close, if I can find it, I want it to, I'm going to close out with this and share this with you guys. If I can find it. Give me one second. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. It may have to be another time. Give me one second. Yes, here we go. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to read this to you because when I was asking God questions today about, Lord, am I where I need to be? As I was studying this and I said, Lord, you said this mountain has to move. What does that mean for me? And how does that apply to our lives? And what are you saying? So in the midst of studying that and asking him questions, and I'm just being, y'all know me, I'm real honest and transparent. Like, okay, God, like, should I do the women's retreat? You know, I'm 
waiting on certain things to fall in place. And, and it just, I don't know. It's not that they're not falling in place. It's just not, I'm becoming impatient, I think, <laughs> in certain areas. I'm like, it should be already done, you know, or whatever. But as I open my scriptures and I begin to study, there's a, a write-up in my Bible. And um, my husband, I was talking to him earlier today, and he said, you know, Siobhan, I just keep saying to God, none of this stuff makes sense that's happening in our lives. Like, why are we doing all these things? It's not making any sense with where we are. When I open my Bible, the title says, When God Doesn't Make Sense. So I'm going to close out with this and read this to you all. <laughs> and I hope it blesses you as it blessed me. Since Jesus had just finished preaching from the wooden pulpit of a borrowed boat, because the crowd was so large, he had taught them from a distance. Following the sermon, he narrowed his attention to the owner of the boat, Simon Peter. Thus, what started as a generic sermon to the multitude had become an instru instruction to someone in particular. What began as a message to the masses moved to personal directed for an individual. Sorry. You've probably experienced that before. A time when the sermon had your name written all over it. Jesus told Peter, Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. In one short statement, Jesus told him where to go into the deep, what to do, let down your nets, and what to expect, a great catch. But Peter complained, Master, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. In other words, he said, Sir, we have tried, there is no hope. That's kind of how I felt today. In those moments, Peter didn't know two clues that I am going to share with you. When we see these two clues in our lives, we should suspect that we are in the vicinity of receiving something very special from God. Clue number one is this, God is not allowing anything that you do to work. Perhaps you feel that you have done everything you can. You've gone job hunting, read the books, gone to counseling, but things still aren't working. When this happens, it's likely that you, like Peter, are exactly where God wants you to be. Clue number two is this, what God asks you to do doesn't make sense. Talk to any fisherman who has worked on the Sea of Galilee and he will tell you that putting a net into the deep waters in the daytime is not the way to catch fish. What Jesus asked Peter to do contradicted his experience, knowledge, and training. Thankfully for Peter, he eventually did the thing that Jesus asked him to do. And because he did, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. Do you know how many fish it takes to break a fisherman's net? If we were to ask Paul, he would probably tell us above and beyond all that we ask or think. Indeed, God can do above and beyond for you as well when you are willing to follow his instructions, despite how far reaching they may sound. So I close tonight encouraging you with that. Doesn't matter how impossible it seems or how crazy it is. Those two clues tell us if it's above your head and it just looks like this doesn't make any sense. And the first one was uh, God's allowing nothing to work <laughs> that you're trying. God is right there with you. 
And he is going to do above and beyond what you could ever ask or think or imagine. Just obey his instruction. Y'all have a good night. I love you. Blessings and peace be upon you. Hugs to each and every one of you. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye. Love you too, Siobhan. Thank you. you too. Bye, Siobhan. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.